مشاهدينا اهلا بكم انا ميسون عزام احييكم من دافوس وانقل لكم هذه الجلسه الحواريه حول ازمه اللاجئين في العالم اجمع طبعا الجلسه ستدار باللغه الانجليزيه بحسب طلب المنظمين من المنتدى الاقتصادي العالمي فاسمحوا لي ان ارحب بالحضور ولكن Um, uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us here in this special debate um, um, by WEF and basically on the crisis of refugees. Um, it's really interesting to know that people in Davos are at this moment discussing how we can live another 200 years while we are here trying to discuss how a refugee can survive a few miles in the water or across the water to reach a safe a haven. So uh, basically this crisis, the refugee crisis, is uh, a global issue and it needs really global solutions and attention. It's a timely subject for two main reasons. The first one is obvious. We all know that this is the worst refugee crisis since World War II. Let us, in a few minutes, remember what's really happening. Well, basically, that was the first reason. As for the second reason, it's uh, personal for me. Um, I'm a refugee myself from birth. And even before that, my parents were forced out of Palestine uh, into neighboring Lebanon. So basically, I feel it. And I feel now that I'm really blessed, slash maybe lucky, it depends on your beliefs, to be sitting here in Davos, stating this issue and addressing it, and uh, also sending a message um, to everybody that nobody has the right to jeopardize the right of the refugee to thrive, flourish, or even dream. Um, let's salute those who were able to make it. لي أن أقوم بحملة لتشجيعهم للذهاب والعودة إلى المدرسة واستمرت ثلاث سنوات وأصبحت ناشطة في مجال التعليم Ich bin Firas Schatte wieder mit euch und heute habe ich meine siebte Zuckerstückchen dabei. Ja, genau wie Brot backen. Erst Zucker raus, Mehl, Hefe, Salz, Wasser und jetzt Haarbrei. 
Seht ihr? Perfekto. Integration. We also have a success story on stage. Uh, Mr. Khan Terzioglu, well, basically with the uh, Turkish uh, touch, the mustache. Um, also, his uh, family experienced displacement during the Greek-Turkish population exchange in 1923. And now he's the CEO of one of the... Turkcell, yes. Turkcell, one of the uh, biggest multinational organization in Turkey. Also on our panel, we are honored to have Mr. Filippo Grandi, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Of course, UNHCR is the most experienced organization in dealing with refugees. They um, existed since um, 1950. Also, Her Excellency Louise Mushi Kiwabo, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation of Rwanda. Welcome. Sarah Pantoliano. Managing Director Overseas Development Institute. Last but not least, Ellen Weidman Gronwald, Senior Vice President, Chief Sustainability and Public Affairs Officer in Ericsson. Welcome, thank you for joining us here where we will explore together how new technologies and partnerships help people on the move. And um, of course, uh, we will have 15 minutes uh, question and answer at the end of the session. But now um, I'd like to start with Mr. Uh, Grandi, Filippo, as you requested. Uh, Filippo, uh, about two years ago, states endorsed uh, the New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants. <clears throat> you thought that this is a milestone, unlike others who were skeptical about it a little bit. Um, could you please brief us about the opportunities that were created uh, by endorsing this declaration? What is important in that declaration was that for the first time, since perhaps the Refugee Convention 1951, the launch of UNHCR, all states, all member states of the UN, basically today, all states in the world, came together agreed that something had to be done to address this global phenomenon, agreed that it was a global phenomenon, so not something that could be handled only by a few countries hosting a large numbers of refugees or a few countries donating money for that. That the, 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 the way to go forward was much broader and had to encompass not only government and international institutions, but also civil society, academia, development organization, and the private sector. So I think it is great that you pulled together this panel that somehow represents all the constituencies. On stage, I don't know about uh, the audience. <laughs> uh, uh, can we test the this. mood uh, in the room? And uh, can I ask for a, a show of hands for those who feel really involved? Was it as an institution or uh, on personal level in this global compact, as you call it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Not promising, or is it promising? Well, <laughs> Thank you. can I just finish saying to say that, uh, of course, this is work in progress. Um, we are testing this approach that involves many other actors in about a dozen countries around the world. And how do you uh, test it? Sorry, because the, the 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 procedure itself is a bit difficult to understand. How can you build it and build this partnership with all of these? Well, there are maybe it's more clear to give some examples. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, traditionally, human um, refugee responses have been humanitarian in mm -hmm. nature. Now we're saying there is an important development component to it, mm -hmm. because what about education? What about livelihoods? What about the host communities that mm. host the refugees? All these have been neglected for a long time. Mm. So we're calling on development institutions and they're responding positively mm. in these countries in which we are, we are rolling out the model. But it is still very much the beginning. We're hoping to- Is it to... slow 
the momentum of this uh, uh, global uh, compact is it slow? Do you think? The moment uh, the momentum has been accelerated. Let's be very very frank mm. by what you showed in your videos by the arrivals of people in rich countries. Mm -hmm. This is what uh, generated the awareness that we have a problem. Because, you know, the real problem is not in the rich countries. It's in the countries that have few resources. 86% of the refugees that we deal with are in poor or middle-income countries. Mm. So that's where the problem is. But for the world to realize that there was a problem, it took Syrians to cross the sea. Mm. It took many mm. African nationals to unfortunately die in the sea. This is what opened the eyes of the world. That momentum, I think, is still there, but we need to keep it going. Okay. We need to keep it going. It will be a very, very long and complicated process. Let's evaluate it uh, from uh, a Rwandan uh, point of view, especially with the history of uh, the Rwanda genocide. Um, how do you evaluate the uh, international community response these days in comparison to what happened then? Oh, sure. Well, first of all, um, my country was uh, one of the uh, countries uh, two years ago that were part of the summit on refugees and uh, pledged uh, specific uh, activities. Um, and so we believe in this model, um, not because it came out of the United Nations General Assembly uh, platform, uh, but because uh, Rwanda is sensitive to um, the life of a refugee. Um, we were a country that uh, in the 60s was the biggest producer of refugees. Uh, we just now at the end of uh, December um, started um, the end of the status of refugee for Rwanda. We just um, invoked uh, the, what is known in international parlance as a secession clause. So we are in a way, um, a country that is already in the mood for uh, the treatment of refugees that would be different from a purely humanitarian uh, approach. Um, and so we, we see also the momentum. So you're active, but what about the rest? <laughs> um, from the feel... experience of Africa, the countries that uh, we work with, uh, whether it's in our neighborhood, both in East Africa and Central Africa, but also at the level of the uh, African Union, where we are quite active, um, there, is, there is visible change. Uh, there is sensitivity to the, the fact that um, refugees need a normal life like anybody else. Um, and so we've been also sharing within our region uh, some of the practices uh, between Rwanda and Uganda, Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have um, a certain understanding which um, we, we believe is something we need to spread more, that when refugees arrive in a new country, there's already hardship mm -hmm. from leaving their home, usually in traumatic circumstances, and a little bit of comfort is not too much to ask uh, for, for countries to, to give. So I'm, I'm actually from, uh, real experience um, in, in dealing with refugee populations. We, we settled uh, back in 2015 uh, close to 80,000 refugees from Burundi, which is south of Rwanda, overnight. Mm. Uh, they are now part of the communities, uh, both in, in south and eastern Rwanda. Uh, we immediately uh, uh, extended our own citizens' um, health care mm. um, uh, we immediately uh, asked our districts to allow the refugee children to be in the schools with the other kids in the communities. You're providing and technology? We're also. providing, yes, absolutely. We, How is it helping? What we see uh, specifically with the young people, mm -hmm. uh, the young people in refugee communities um, are, are more, um, they are the recipients, they are more uh, accepting of, of technology, but they also see a future, uh, mm -hmm. as many young people with, with technology. So, so I think there's a lot to say about refugees and, okay. and why, what has awakened uh, everybody. No, I mentioned uh, technology because um, uh, Filippo was talking about the global compact that 
uh, is composed of different uh, sectors, including the private sectors, uh, sector which is usually um, seen as not having a human face. So now uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Khan, uh, Khan, why um, do you want to be part of this global compact when you can do it alone? Uh, first of all, we talk a lot about technologies, and technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, IOTs, mobile networks. When we talk about these, the first thing that comes to our minds are driverless cars, humanless factories. Actually, there is another face of technology. There are groups of people with very special needs. Disabled people, maybe very young people, all elderly, and one of those special groups is refugees who are going through very tough you know, journeys in their lives. That's why we thought um, you know, we could actually touch the quality of their lives by making sure that the best technologies, most advanced technologies, are used to create a difference. You know, when from the early days of the conflict in Syria, Turkey probably has been uh, home for over 3 million refugees, I think 3.5 currently is in Turkey, probably close to 5 million people passed over Turkey. And um, what we have first noticed was an incredible surge in connectivity needs. You know, the first thing a refugee asks when they go to a camp is not necessarily water or food, it's the password of the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, many ignorant people think that those smartphones uh, they are luxury. They are not for somebody who has left family behind and who has other family members ahead of them. So it's really, we, we figured out that connectivity and communication was part of the basic humanitarian need at that time. You know, we immediately fortified our network in that area because, you know, we suddenly had doubled uh, utilization of our capacity. But later on, we talked uh, to these people. We understood that, you know, in their minds, you know, there was no home back, it was destroyed, and for the next five, ten years, their future was in a different country. Ken, uh, this yeah. is really interesting and yeah. very impressive, but my point was uh, mm -hmm. to talk about business sector in collaboration with the humanitarian organization. Yes. Why would you want to be part of it? Well, Why don't you do it on your own? You're a businessman and you can do all of this and you're gaining more uh, clients, let's put it this way, uh, to sure. your business. Sure, but I think it's important to you know, commit to certain global standards of doing business, uh, which everybody understands and values. And when you do something in the context of a bigger initiative, which can be replicated around the world, I think it gives a totally different meaning. That's why we are one of the signatories of Global Compact, and we contribute all aspects of doing responsible and good business uh, and one of those areas is actually util utilizing the uh, technologies for the best humanitarian causes. And this could be for, of course, the, in this type of a situation, refugees, because you know, their future lives will depend on how fast they can learn a language, mm -hmm. how fast they can get support uh, from the right government institutions so that they don't fall into the hands of you know, human traders and things like that. Therefore, I think, you know, uh, our duty, especially as mobile operators around the world, to make sure that you know, we create these type of uh, platforms to make sure that we are there when these type of emergencies happen. Mm -hmm. And I see all around the world that you know, my colleagues in other countries as well are stepping up to the challenge. Uh, Alain, what do you think is needed more uh, when we talk about this uh, collaboration between public and private sector? We started working with humanitarian issues about 17 years ago, and I remember the first time that um, we showed up at the UN and we said it was the earthquake in Afghanistan around 2001 or 2002, and we went to the UN and we said, you, what you need is telecommunications. You need to be able to communicate, and they thought we were crazy. This company from Sweden, no thank you. And you know, from the founding days of Ericsson, building on what Khan said, we, we have a saying that our founder coined, which is access to communication is a basic human need. It doesn't matter if you're a refugee or if you're anyone sitting in the audience, it is a fundamental you know, need of humans to be able to communicate. So I think what's happening now, which is really interesting, and if you just look at the theme of, of this year's World Economic Forum, which is the fractured world, no one actor, UNHCR will never solve this alone. A government will never solve this alone. Any company will never solve this alone. But the companies 
are looking at it different today than they were 15 years ago. I think the private sector is saying, actually, the SDGs gives us a framework here where we can engage and this can become relevant for us. So whether you're a telecom, like we are, whether you're maybe health industry, mm -hmm. whatever sector you are, now you have a new opportunity to engage on but these issues. But is there a body, like a certain body, to coordinate between all these, Sara, in a few words? How do you feel you can all be together in this? There isn't a body, but I think there is definitely um, a, a move towards you know, a greater collaboration in whatever we do in the humanitarian sector and for businesses who are interested to partner with the humanitarian sector. The, the forum is a great convener. It is ultimately the international organization for public and private partnerships and is definitely incentivizing and promoting a number of these collaborations. But these are happening at very different levels. You know, locally, you know, local businesses are very important partners for humanitarian organizations as well as at the corporate level where you know, some of the um, the, the stronger partnerships can be established around innovation and around you know, sort of identifying ways to perhaps you know, address difficult challenges where the, the competencies of both worlds are, are critical. Thank you very much. We'll take a break. Mushahidina Fasel, one was. We'll take a break. Uh, please stay with us. Ten seconds only. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, uh, dear viewers. We are still here in Davos uh, discussing the plight of refugees. As we said before, we will be conducting this debate in English. It's as old as our history itself. Every one of us is a migrant in a way or another. However, the situation reached its peak with the Syrian crisis. So let us have a look at the number of refugees in the Middle East. Sarah, Sarah, I need to go back to you and talk about, uh, you felt very relaxed when talking about what's happening now. I'd like to quote you. You said, every conflict is unique. One thing I've done with my team is ban the word unprecedented. Every crisis is always defined that way. That means that we never look at what we've learned from similar instances in the past. It justifies that every aid approach needs to be unique, so we're forever reinventing the wheel. Reinventing the wheel. <laughs> yes. And to be frank with you, this is how I feel. Whenever we talk about the refugee crisis, as if we are talking about a new phenomena, why, with all the stock of uh, discussion and uh, research that also you covered and did, uh, we couldn't find uh, a solution or at least, let's say, uh, manage it in a proper way? There are many reasons for that. A lot of them are political. You know, a lot of these crises have political roots and politicians don't want to find the, the, the leadership and the courage to address that. Um, but there are Louise, also- you can more... comment, by the way, if you feel yes, offended <laughs> or you agree. Do you agree? Talking actually more about, you know, our politicians in agree. Europe that define, you know, the, the, what we see, the arrivals as a crisis. The numbers are minuscule. I find it, um, mystifying that for a continent like Europe with the wealth and the expertise and the capacities that we have, that we call this a refugee crisis. When we've had countries that have much bigger challenges, you know, economically in all sorts of different ways, welcoming numbers that dwarf by a very large measure 
what we're seeing in Europe. This will lead me to one point, uh, Filippo. Uh, do you think that the refugee system in Europe uh, needs to be changed? Because what I see is that they say to the people, listen, you can come to us. We, our doors are open if you make it. If you survive, then you're welcomed. While if I take my experience, for example, I lived in the Gulf, and basically despite the fact that they don't have this refugee as called in Europe and in, in other countries, we as refugees lived in the Gulf countries without feeling uh, like an outsider. Mm. I didn't feel like an outsider. Uh, in Saudi Arabia lately, they, uh, since the um, Syrian crisis, they reunited 500,000 uh, Syrians. Of course, if we, we are without calling them refugees, while in Europe they say refugees, and they provided free education, free medication, and work permit. So although they don't have this refugee system, still they are more open to have those people and didn't accept, as other people said, let them stay in the tents, the air-conditioned tents in Mecca. So do you think the, there is a problem with the system? I think uh, there is a problem with parts of the system. The, system, the, the traditional system of Europe to uh, screen refugees and to receive refugees was good enough for small numbers mm -hmm. that made it in the past. But with increased mobility, which we have seen with the latest crisis, the system has collapsed in so many ways. It has collapsed as a reception system. We have seen it. It has collapsed as a shared system. Europe is not unanimous. Europe has no concept of, no more a concept of shared solidarity. Some states do, some states don't. And what I think this uh, crisis has revealed is a profound weakness that goes to the point that I think you mentioned, which is the weakness of integration. Uh, clearly, uh, the, 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 the cumbersomeness of the integration process in Europe and uh, its gaps and limitations show very clearly. You see, many of the people that are not first generation, but second, third, mm -hmm. uh, are problematic people. Why? That is a failure of integration. That's not just for refugees, by the way. This is also for economic migrants. So I think that there are several things that Europe needs to, be, to do. One is to look again at how it receives people, at how it shares this responsibility, and how it integrates people. And I think that some leaders, like uh, Emmanuel Macron in France, for example, mm. are starting to see this quite clearly and trying to steer action in this direction, but... Well, I'm this... not sure about that, because now they're, uh, they're going to enforce more uh, strict sure. laws in... But, uh, but there are two Paris. big problems. One is the politicization of this issue that pushes states always towards restrictive legislation, and the other one is this lack of solidarity. Mm -hmm. what, what, the, the, what happened in Germany in 2016, in 1516, when the chancellor said, Syrians are welcome, mm. is that what, what failed her was not Germany, mm. was the solidarity of Europe to share that responsibility, so that it all fell on a few countries. So these are the issues that really need to be changed in Europe for the future. The problem of integration, or the issue of integration, is really important. Rwanda offered to accept uh, and invite 30,000 refugees now. Correct. Um, uh, what about integration and uh, uh, does technology play a role in that? Yes. Well, first of all, if I can quickly um, comment um, on what uh, Filippo said, um, I, I think we all, global leaders, need to pause, take a deep breath, and look at the problem with a mind to solve it. Um, we're not doing that, which is why I'm not offended at all. I think there is. Um, there is need for more political engagement. It's easy sometimes for us politicians to hide behind the word humanitarian. But refugees are usually a product of bad politics. So we need to face that. And, and if I can be critical of both um, Europe and Africa, uh, and I've, I've said this to our European colleagues in, in our uh, renewed uh, relationship as continents. Mm. Europe needs uh, to be patient, to take time, and to look at the problem of refugees. Um, 
it's not something that will go away with um, uh, uh, good slogans, with um, calming down the European uh, citizens. They need, the citizens of Europe need to understand what is going on, why people are coming to um, their countries, and what their countries and their leaders should do mm -hmm. uh, to, first of all, stop refugees from coming to Europe, but when they come to Europe, deal with it. Um, on the African side, so Europe, I think for all of us, we need, we need seriousness and we need patience. And from the multiple engagements I've, I've been in, um, Europeans are always in a hurry. You know, you take half a day, you come with a ready a made um, outcome document and you look good on TV and you've solved the refugee problem. It doesn't work like that. On the African side, um, given the many, many young African lives um, lost in the Mediterranean, we also, as a continent, um, whether we're countries that produce refugees, whether we're transit countries, we as a continent, in this spirit of you know, integrated uh, solutions, really need to take our responsibility as well. Uh, it, it's something we, we cannot continue to delay. I am hoping that um, this is a discussion uh, at a level that is needed, that is uh, coming up uh, in Africa. I mean, we, we, uh, we volunteered, Rwanda volunteered to take in these a number of uh, uh, migrants mm. uh, uh, stuck in Libya, being sold like cattle. Uh, simply because we, we think as human beings, it's shocking that this should be happening at this particular time. Um, and we are a small country. Uh, we, we have limited means, but we feel that we can offer better than what is uh, uh, given to these uh, Africans And hopefully in North the Africa. private uh, sector will be also um, as helpful as needed. Absolutely. Um, I, I'd like to uh, re-mention what uh, Khan said at the beginning. Um, when people leave their country, the smartphone is not a sign of richness. It's the only thing that connects them to the people left behind, or the way to communicate with the people in the new country. One of the major emphasis of this session is to explore ways in which technology can shape a new approach to the refugee crisis. We believe the global village can also make the refugees' life a bit more bearable. Let us watch together this short clip about the refugee application. Ellen, um, what is needed to change or shift private sector from being just donors into an active contributor in this issue? I think the, the two big opportunities right now with the private sector, I mean, every company needs to decide for themselves based on you know, what, they, what they do, how they want to engage. Some companies engage in, engage in philanthropy, others work more with solutions. We have always looked at it from two perspectives. One is a technology solution agenda. That's how we look at it. We think about how can the technology play a role. So, I mean, you talk about apps there. Uh, we work with the organization Refunite and have done so for several years on just a really simple idea to help people connect and find missing family or loved ones. And I think that's 
a really important service. They have close to a million refugees registered on that now. But coming at it from the app, for me, unless you're an app developer, is the tip of the iceberg. iceberg. There's a much bigger digital transformation opportunity um, that the private sector can bring into this discussion. And whether that's, you know, it becomes a buzzword, digital transformation, but it's actually a very important um, opportunity where you can look at everything from the beneficiary and the person that you're serving, but also these very big organizations in the UN. How can they um, transform their own operations through, through digital technology and then the whole supply chain leading into it? So sometimes I, I um, get a bit frustrated. We talk about digitalization, but it's not an app. I mean, it, it's actually what industries are doing today. The automobile industry is digitalizing. The health sector is digitalizing. The humanitarian sector needs to digitalize. And I think that's where we think of it more from what's our core business. If I was in pharmaceuticals, I would think more about the drugs we could bring. But mm -hmm. I'm in telecom and technology, so we think more what we can bring as an industry. And there are a lot of really important industry initiatives going on around. Um, we have a humanitarian connectivity charter that the GSM Association has put together. We have you know, big initiatives within the mobile sector. And I think more sectors need to start to think through that value proposition in terms of what they can bring and, and the benefits. Because of course, the private sector also needs to have a return on investment for, for if we're going to do really deeper um, commitments. Yeah, uh, can, uh, do you have any specific initiative that you can share with us that helped refugees, but at the same time generated money so uh, everybody's happy here? So first of all, we proudly serve 1.7 million refugees. When we started focusing on this uh, particular issue, it was 1.2. And uh, we looked into the specific issues that they need, like you know, voice-to-voice -voice translation was actually a technology that has been categorized as a nice-to-have. For them, it's a must-have technology. And now it has been used more than 10 million times. We have actively people trying to learn a new language, look for jobs, uh, search for proper uh, government support. But uh, I think you know, it's so, the piece I don't understand, and maybe because I don't know politics that well, maybe I'm not familiar with UN policies, but we really try hard not to lose one customer. We spend a lot of money to acquire customers as businesses. And when I look to this group of individuals, I see potential for hardworking, good tax-paying individuals five years, seven years out. If I was the government, I would really embrace this opportunity. These are do you, very do you do important economic this building is, blocks for the future. This is really interesting. I think this is a key point. Absolutely. It's a key point. You see, I think that I was reflecting, listening to the mm. other speakers. We are really moving, and we are moving. We should not say we should move. We are moving from a concept of humanitarian assistance, which is based on relief, especially in the case of refugees, to a concept that is based on inclusion. So refugees need to be included, mm. even if it is a temporary period, because maybe they'll go back to their country. And what we said earlier about refugees being included in, na in national health services, mm. in education services, what Khan said about basically refugees being included in, uh, in the services of a business company, in the provided by a business company. This is what we need to promote and foster. Mm. And you see, whilst relief in the world of relief refugees were closed in refugee camps, organizations like mine basically could cope with NGOs and others and governments. Now it's a broader challenge for which we do need the private sector, for which we do need development actors, for which we need states to act in a different manner. And I go back to your first question. Mm -hmm. This is what the compact is about. Mm -hmm. This is the ambition of the compact. And, I think and we'll we, get ho we hope that uh, we can get some answers for uh, um, uh, Sarah. <coughs> can we find answers through all the research that uh, uh, have been done regarding the obstacles that uh, uh, Filippo just mentioned and the challenges? Do we have any solutions in hand? I mean, the solution, to be honest, the research all points to, to the same um, critical um, issue there is the incentives to change. You know, we need a mindset shift. We need to 
move beyond you know, doing business as usual and embracing the new reality that we see um, that, that, that puts you know, the refugee as any other person in a crisis at the center of what we do. Technology allows us to do that. You know, the feedback loop with the people that we work with obviously can be more continuous and more direct. But that challenges also you know, the way in which many organizations have done business up to now. You know, what Filippo was talking about, you know, the relief that we provide, it puts humanitarian organizations in a position of power to determine what this relief is and how it's given and how it's distributed, allowing you know, a continuous feedback loop to technology means you know, accepting to be challenged in, in, in the ability to decide, you know, and, and which also means the ability to set standards, perhaps. You know, some, some of this can be benign. It's not you know, necessarily about protecting, if, if you want, the, the humanitarian market share of an organization. But it is, you know, it does require organizations to think very differently about the potential that these collaborations offers and how critical it is to really put the people um, at the center of, you know, what, you know, determining, choosing what they want to buy, what they want to use the aid that we provide for. It, too often we decide for them. You know, in any crisis, particularly refugee crisis I've been involved in, it strikes me that after six months, people always ask for the same thing, education and jobs. Mm. Those are the two things you will always hear. What do we give them? Tents, food, all sorts of other things that are not the priority for them. Mm. And we need to accept, to you know, shift the way in which we We're work. thinking and we need to take a break. <laughs> a short break, dear viewers, stay with us. Dear viewers, welcome back. Uh, we are here in Davos uh, discussing the plight and the crisis of refugees. We will now open the floor for questions and answers. As promised, we'll open the floor for questions from your side. Uh, I believe Mr. Hasbani, the Deputy Prime Minister and the uh, Health Minister in Lebanon, would like, uh, I don't know if it is a question or... Uh, uh, basically, is it a comment? But uh, if you please address the person in question. Well, thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, just to correct a couple of uh, numbers that appeared on the screen. Um, in Lebanon, we have more than 997,000 refugees from Syria. They exceed the 1.2, 1.3 million. Well, th this uh, is the latest so number, by th the way. And it was the... news that it reduced. And the reasons they said, we uh, don't know, maybe killed, yeah. maybe in prison. But the reason that was said is that uh, some of them went back home. Others uh, died. And some no. of them were part of uh, some uh, um, no, let, uh, me, uh, let me clarify. These are UNHCR numbers, but a lot of them are not registered with the NACR. So mm -hmm. the numbers are much larger, usually, than what is actually officially declared by UNHCR. Some may have gone back, but others are still pouring in. And yesterday we had about 20 of them die in the cold as they snuck into the illegal routes through the mountains. So that's, that's not the, the issue, just a, a side note. Well, yeah. However, well, one thing for sure that we've talked about services, but somebody has to pay for these services. And the uh, donor community is helping as much as possible through crisis response. But we do need to go beyond that. And my first question is that, how do we avoid donor fatigue uh, in that matter? Because we're starting to see that. The second point is somebody has to actually provide those services. And either governments or private sector, irrespective, can provide that. Our experience in Lebanon, we've been providing healthcare services paid for by UNHCR, uh, largely. We've been providing electricity, uh, effectively for free, uh, roads, infrastructure, water, etc. Uh, so basically, funding has to come from somewhere, and there's host community fatigue. Mm. I totally subscribe to the point that uh, a new mindset has to emerge. One is that host communities need to be invested in to be able to support those services delivered to refugees. Secondly, technology is a great uh, thing to reduce costs, which is a tool to reduce costs. However, somebody still has to fit the bill. Mm. Uh, it doesn't you know, come for free. Uh, however, it helps UNHCR and host communities reduce their costs. And I do subscribe to that, and we've experimented with this in Lebanon, providing uh, 
remote medicine in primary health care centers that treat refugees and citizens alike. Mm. So the second question is that how do you actually move to start funding and supporting host communities through the same mechanism rather than simply rely on uh, okay. mechanisms like the World Bank and further indebting countries that are receiving refugees to be able to pay the bill. Mr. And Hassan, build the because you're a minister, Thank I you. gave you more time, but that doesn't mean that uh, we have all the time here, except for some people. <laughs> um, uh, so, Filippo, would you like to answer money, money, money? <laughs> <laughs> First of all, let me say that I agree with the Deputy, Minister, uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Lebanon and our dialogue with Lebanon on these issues has been long, intense and very fruitful because a lot of the lessons learned have been learned in places like Lebanon and Jordan, in fact, that we have then applied to other countries. Um, I think that in a way I'm, I'm packaging the two questions in, in one reply. Um, I think, I think that the, the, um, we need to look for different resources. Humanitarian funding dries up. Let me tell you, I've worked with humanitarian issues for more than 30 years, and this is the lesson we've learned over and over again. Humanitarian funding goes away when the crisis inevitably gets displaced by another crisis coming on the screen or on the internet. So I think that we need to look at longer term, not one year half a year funding for relief items, mm -hmm. but real investments. Mm -hmm. And that type of uh, funding, which is really an investment type funding, if you want to call it like this, doesn't dry up that quickly, is multi-year, generates uh, 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 other advantages, multiple advantages that last in time much more than humanitarian funding. I'm not suggesting that humanitarian funding should stop. Mm -hmm. We've just seen it in the Rohingya crisis in, in Bangladesh. People came with nothing. You cannot wait for development to come in with its slower pace. But do you have you, plans? You have to briefly. do it. But I think that we do have plans. You know, the World Bank, I understand the World Bank funding has some complicated aspect because some of it, not all of it, especially in lower income countries, come in the form of grants. But some of it comes in the form of very soft loans. But that's a response. The bank put aside just recently for countries mostly in Africa $2 billion for refugee affected countries, meaning for refugees, but also for host communities. Mm -hmm. So I think we're seeing there the beginning of an answer. And I hope that bilateral development donors will follow suit with their greater ability to mobilize grant funding for both refugees and host communities. Um, another question? Anybody? Okay. Um, sure, thank you. My name is John Juicy. I'm with the GSM Association, so working with the mobile industry globally. So I'm very pleased the role mobile is playing on this panel. But I was just curious for the panel's thoughts on, on how digital solutions um, through companies like, like Khan's company can be sort of an ongoing sustainable approach to meeting development needs how much of it could be done by private sector and then how much has to be done through humanitarian support? Ken and Ellen, I think. Sure. Uh, I think, you know, uh, there is a really a critical moment when people start to come into a country and go through certain camps. It, and it needs actually an immediate response because suddenly you have 10 times, 100 times capacity needs. And I remember in those days, we made huge investments in that region, which were not planned, which were not subsidized by anyone. We, we, we didn't expect that money to come back. But ultimately, when you do the right things at the right time, people remember. That's how you know we, we had now 1.7 million very loyal customers. And I believe that those investments, which were maybe seen as, as expenditure in those days, uh, now we see them as, as jewels of our uh, business. And I think, you know, that was also part of our commitment in Global Compact, saying that, you know, in these type of situations, we will be there with the connectivity needs. So it was a basic principle which paid us uh, very well. But I think, you know, it's, uh, it's really critical that we actively seek for opportunities to make technology be in the service of humanity. And there are so many opportunities, not only for refugees, for disabled people, for elderly people, there are so many things we can do together and actually create economies around as mm -hmm. well. Ellen? 
your input I, I on this. I want to come back to something that Sarah said. It's, it's along the same lines as the question and, and also some of the work Turkcell is doing, but on, on the, this concept of um, skills building in jobs. And I think the only way really, I mean, in, in what Filippo said, you pour money into a problem and then comes the next crisis. So it has to be some mechanism about rebuilding communities. And we have been involved. I mean, one of the amazing things about mobile technology is there, today there's 7 billion subscriptions. Every village will be connected. The internet will be there. Then it doesn't mean everybody can afford it. There still are divides, but the, the basic infrastructure is there. So I don't understand why we talk about education if we don't talk about digital education. So we're involved in a, in a big project in northern Uganda where you have the South Sudanese crisis and looking at how to skill up people in open internet cafes, open internet centers, provide education to revenue. Not, I mean, you know, I'm not commenting on or criticizing any model about whether delivering food or tents or, or whatever, but helping people to gain the confidence to rebuild their lives, I think, you know, and, and to put that together, I think what we need to think about in, in these types of forms is how do we form the coalitions of the willing, actually. Mm. The, the parties that, don't bring me the people that say, oh, we can't do that, it's so hard, it's too complicated. We can just get it done. I mean, you know, we don't, we're not education specialists, but we have technology to bring mobile internet out. You have the access in all the countries, the governments can provide support, the operators can help maybe in the beginning discount the data rates to get the service to work. We need people to help measure, fund, everything. So, I mean, you just put the right people together, create this coalition of the willing, and I think we can do a lot more than, you know, complain about the crisis, so. Yeah. That's good. Fatme, my colleague. Hello, I'm uh, Maysoon's colleague, but uh, I couldn't stop myself to ask you, Turkcell, how, where, who pays the bill? Who pays the bill for these technologies? At the end of the day, there's a bill at the end of the month to pay, and you sure. guys are making money out of it, sure. and technology is the new high. It makes a lot of money. We're seeing new billionaires coming in every day. Sure. Who pays the bill? Uh, first of all, there are certain expenditure nobody pays the bill. You know, you have to put the infrastructure, put the fiber in, you know, all the base stations. But later on, uh, the priorities of the people are as said here. It's not necessarily first food, it's about communication. So from probably their limited budgets, they actually pay those bills and they are much better payers than the rest of the community, you can count on it. Refugees? But, uh, of, absolutely. So where absolutely. do they get the money from? Well, this is a phenomenal, I think, misunderstanding. Most of the refugees are not there because they don't have money. They are there because they are afraid of their lives being at risk exactly. at home. They sell their cars, they sell everything they have, they put cash in their pockets, they walk and they come into a country for a hope to live a better life. So don't think that these are necessarily people not having the money or economic resources means, if you look to last quarter of Turkish GDP growth, 11%, and some of that attributable to those hardworking people when given the chance, can make a difference. So this is not, you know, uh, you know, money for charity. No. This is real business yes. and making differences in people's lives. Are you happy? For then, me? then we probably need to send you some more customers. Well, we have a question. We'll take only one question. Last question. Sorry, but we're running out of time. So. Make it quick, please. I'm Christopher Mickelson. I run Refugee that Elaine referenced earlier, helping about a million refugees looking for their missing children and siblings, parents, and so on right now. I want to build on the point of education, because education is wonderful. I truly believe it is one of the few things that will make a lasting impact. But after education comes jobs. And this is perhaps a question for the government representative. Uh, we find that uh, the distance to the online economy is shrinking, even in some of the worst hit areas across Sub-Saharan Africa. But many governments are not willing to allow, mm. enable refugees to work and make a living. Mm. So we have large informal economies that are thriving, but they're not brought into a position where they can truly capitalize on it. Mm. Why do you think that is, and how can we change that? And brief, please. Well, yes. Well, uh, first of all, uh, our my own country's uh, policy. I think, especially in the last um, in the last few years, is that 
we need to look at this refugee concept differently, totally differently. These people are here. Most of them come from neighboring countries. It's important for the stability of our region to take care of them. So when, um, for, for example, uh, when uh, the refugees from Burundi came in, and, and I agree, many of them came driving their own cars through the border. What did they ask for? About 20,000 of them. They wanted the government to allow them uh, to waive their fee to register their car, which is, is an unusual request uh, for a refugee. <laughs> Uh, but it was needed because they, they arrive in a new country. They are allowed to drive for, I think, 30 days. They didn't think they were going to be in Rwanda for a long time. So this request came, and the minister in charge of refugees came to me. And I talked to the migration office and the police, and it was granted. So um, the, the, when, when we look at jobs and education, we look at it in terms of the communities mm -hmm. where the refugees are. We don't, we no longer separate refugee community and the other people in our districts. And we we look at their well-being all together. And we no longer have time. Thank you very much, everybody. Dear viewers, thank you for watching. We leave you with this uh, quick report uh, by UNHCR and the World Economic Forum. Thank you for watching. We're going to uh, show a short video. refugees who worked and benefited from the project. The main challenge in solar is just to clean the panels in a regular basis. So we will also train 40 other refugees to operate and maintain and clean the panels.